introduce Dr Kim Judge. Kim is a senior staff scientist at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute and works in the research and development team and specialises in sequencing technology. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ron. Hi. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, that's about the introduction. Uh, yes, I am Kim. I look a bit, bit like that. Thanks for pointing it out, Ron. And uh, yeah, it's uh, good to be here today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sequencing technologies. So, uh, as I'm sure many of you here will know, this is the timeline of the very first uh, sequences. So we have the first ever DNA sequence from Fred Sanger, who we're named after, in 1997, 1977. And uh, from there, it uh, takes a couple of decades until we can get the first uh, bacterial genome in 1995. But after that, the genomes start to follow fairly quickly. We have yeast in 1996 a worm in 1997, so this is the nematode worm, so not a garden earthworm that you might be thinking of, but a tiny worm of about only 1,000 uh, cells. And then coming on to the human genome in 2001. We, we say 2001, there's still bits of it we're working on now, actually, but we consider it as having been finished as a draft in 2001. And then not long after that, in uh, 2008 to 2015, the 1,000 Genomes Project, which is attempting to capture some of the human diversity that we have, so uh, hopefully it seems as rapid to you as to me, but it's a, a really exciting emerging field to be, uh, to be working in. So the Human Genome Project, which we're very proud to be a part of here at the Sanger Institute, you can see the uh, share that we uh, completed there coloured here in blue. Um, so it's a three billion base genome, or three gigabases, and it cost three billion dollars, nice and easy to remember. It was a collaboration between scientists, and I think it's something that, uh, as a community, we're really proud of in that uh, it was done in the UK by a number of institutes in America and um, had collaborations from people worldwide, as you can see with the key in uh, Europe, Japan and China. However, it was also a competition as well because of a certain person called Craig Ventner. Now, he had the idea that it would be possible to commercialise the... Uh, human genome, and that's really what sparked off the race to the finish, so it was an exciting time. One thing that I think people kind of have a concept of is maybe there is somebody out there walking around who is the first human genome, who was it, who was the person that we sequenced. Actually, it's a combination of people's DNA, so a number of people gave a sample. Of those, a subset of people's samples were taken forward and used in the human genome, so actually it's a mosaic, it's a combination of many different people. So back in the time when this was first happening, I think there was a lot of um, debate about how would this genetic information be used. So there is no one person out there who was uh, at risk of being exploited from this. So the good news is, from my point of view anyway, that uh, the uh, collaborative scientists won. The human genome is publicly accessible, as are many other species. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other species a little bit later on. So this is a picture of the old sequencing lab. You've just been around and seen the new sequencing lab. As you can probably see, it's a pretty major kind of operation to get the sequencing done. Uh, we have these fantastic machines. Um, they're worth something in the region of a million dollars each, and they require quite careful air conditioning, um, humidity control, temperature control, um, reinforced benches, a whole operation, um, and we have a great team on site here that runs the sequences as well. It takes many, many people to get the sequence out of these, and um, we have a number of those machines on site today being used for the 100,000 Genomes Project. So this was kicked off uh, by David Cameron a couple of years ago, and uh, what really sparked this off was the fact that we can now sequence a genome for $1,000, and so at this stage it starts to become a very credible thing to use in healthcare. Um, if we want to, we can spend more money and sequence a human in a single day. So compared to the many, many years it took here on site to get the first human genome, um, if we're prepared to put more resources into it rather than doing it as economically as possible, um, you can be sequenced by this time tomorrow, which I find incredible. Um, the focus of the 100,000 Genome <coughs> Project uh, is predominantly cancer but also rare diseases. So that might be an instance where there is a child who has um, a genetic mutation that is difficult to diagnose, and uh, we can use sequencing, hopefully, to understand a little bit more about what is going on in that individual cells. So uh, sequencing attracts uh, all the bigwigs. So here we have a picture of the Queen. This is not on site, but this is at the Crick Institute in London. So the Queen has started an Illumina sequencing run. 
and uh, traditionally we dress slightly less formally to do it but it can be done in in the full hat and coat if you wish uh, we've also had Theresa May on site here to talk a little bit more about science and uh, how we see the future developing and as part of that she came and uh, saw the sequences for herself. So how are they actually working? That's a pretty important thing to get to the bottom of. Well with Illumina sequencing we take a small amount of DNA that's been fragmented into short pieces. These pieces would typically be in the region of 300 bases or nucleotides long. So this is quite a short fragment and um, we then amplify this, so by using the um, complementary nature of DNA, um, splitting it, filling in the strands to make two strands, and then repeating this process multiple times, so that each small fragment replicates itself to become a cluster. And this cluster is easier to see than one single fragment, which means that... Oh, wrong way, sorry. When we then come to image the cluster, it's easier to detect. So after having caused the DNA to replicate itself and form this cluster, we flow over the surface of the flow cell nucleotides, which are labelled uh, A, G, C and T in different colours. And each one will um, be imaged in a slightly different way when we um, pass a laser over it. The DNA is single-stranded and each base incorporates one at a time. It's stopped from incorporating by a chemical block. So a single base incorporates, we then image that to record which base is present, and then we flow over it a D-block solution, and this cleaves that block, meaning that the DNA is then receptive to the next nucleotide to come along. And in this way, we can process very logically and orderly through a small number of bases, and it would be typical to sequence maybe up to um, 200 bases of DNA in this way. Uh, we do that on these flow cells, and I think on the tables you've got some flow cells. So these are like the small glass slides. So you can probably see in them at each end there's very tiny holes, and we put sippers into these so that we can flow the chemicals into them. The picture on the right just here is what you're actually seeing in the camera. So it should kind of look like um, space if you look at it under the best possible telescope you can, like a whole galaxy full of stars. And each little dot that you can see there is actually one of the clusters of DNA. Each one will be light, so we take four images. So in this image, for example, we'll be seeing everything that's lit up with an A. We'd then take a different image, and the position of those clusters would change, and in that we'd be seeing everything that was lit up with a C, for example. So we're taking the four images, each image is picking up a slightly different wavelength corresponding to the different colour that the base is labelled with. And in this way, we can build up a pattern of what sequence is present. So here we have a picture of it. So um, imagining it with the colours in, we can pick out for this single dot in this position that it's lighting up green in the first time, so that's an A. Next it lights up blue, which is a C, and so on and so on. And in this way, for that specific dot or cluster, we can build up a picture of what the sequence is. So it's a very reliable way of doing things. It works with short pieces of DNA, but it's got a very low error rate. It's very accurate, and it's been the basis of a number of the, of the developments that we've seen in sequencing, such as cancer or detecting um, antimicrobial resistance in bacteria, because it's extremely accurate. However, we've got another player on the market now, which you might have seen on the tour. You have? Fran's nodding. Okay, so this is PacBio. So in comparison to Illumina, it kind of flips it round. So Illumina is really good at accurately sequencing a large number of short molecules. This is good at accuracy, accurately sequencing a small number of large molecules. So we can get a lot more information from one strand, but we don't get as many strands out. So you have a trade-off to make as a scientist about which is the most important thing for your project. Do you want the longest pieces of information or do you want the most pieces of information? And this is a technology we're using for the 25 Genome Project. So how does this one work? It's actually in kind of a similar way to how Illumina works. Again, we have these four um, bases that are all labelled with a specific colour. But instead of mechanically flowing it in sequencing only one base, stopping, taking a picture, cleaving the block reagent and processing in these cycles, everything kind of happens in one go. We have uh, tethered at the bottom of a well on the packed bioflow cell a polymerase and this processes the strand of the DNA just as it would in a cell. 
Here it incorporates onto the single strand of DNA these four fluorescently labelled bases and instead of taking individual pictures, we film it as a movie so we can see what's happening almost in real time. And this is the reason why we can sequence a much longer fragment. So one of the problems if you're a single-stranded piece of DNA is you don't really want to be single-stranded. You, your DNA, you want to be double-stranded. That's how the molecule is stable. The worst possible thing if you're DNA and you're single-stranded is to get battered with a laser all of the time because that's going to cause damage. So with this, we can avoid the intensity of the laser and get the DNA fragment to be much longer when we sequence it. So, 25 Genomes, here's a plug for public engagement. I listened, Fran. Right. Why not get your school involved? So, here at Sanger, as for our 25th birthday, we are sequencing 25 new species that haven't had their genome sequenced before. These are species that we find in the UK. Uh, we've picked out 20 of them, and the pack bio machines that you saw will probably have already started sequencing them as you're in there. They've definitely already started doing some of the samples. But five of the species are still to be decided upon. So if you can go to the website, 25 Genomes, I'm a Scientist, you can vote for five species that we will do. So we're taking um, votes from anyone in the public, but especially school kids. So get your students involved if you'd like to have a say in what you're here hearing about this time next year. So this is a Google map of the whole site. And the reason that I show this is to kind of give a bit of context. You've been lucky enough to see the tour, but for other people, about how massive this place is. So this is kind of a town that is everything about it is dedicated to DNA sequencing. So the reason that these two bits are in blue here is because we built two entire new buildings since the Google camera came over, which is kind of awesome. So we have... Um, uh, a building full of sequences. We have a building full of DNA analysis. This one is also full of DNA analysis. Uh, this is the building that we're currently in, which is full of a lot of labs doing the DNA extractions and working with the animals that we have on site. Um, this is the all-important canteen. This is more analysis. And the arrows up there point to um, the nursery that we've got on site, the hotel that we've got on site. We've got a conference centre on site. There is over a thousand people just working at Sanger and even more than that on site. So it would be kind of crazy if I told you that we could do DNA sequencing in a machine like that. But we can. So this is an important distinction. I will get this out the way at the start. Right? <laughs> this is a minion. That's a minion. Pronounce it the same. If you type minion into Google, if you are delighted by this technology and you want to find more about it, which brilliant, but you'll just get the yellow guys. D type in Oxford Minion and uh, the sequencer will come up. So it looks kind of like this. I was going to bring a spare one to pass around, but actually I've accidentally done some sequencing on it. So what we'll do is um, at the end, if you want to come up and see a bit more about it, then um, you can come and have a look at this one up here and uh, I'll be happy to talk through a bit more about it. But it has um, the machine here and what's inside it is this flow cell. So the machine is something what we use, reuse again and again, but the flow cell is a disposable part. So we would swap that out for different samples. And you possibly saw these on your tour. So here are our three bears. So these are kind of all made with the same underlying chemistry, but actually they're just different sizes to allow us to work at different scales. So this one in the front here is the minion. We also have the gridiron, which is kind of like five minions in a box sat on top of a big computer. And then this one in the corner here is the Promethean, which we don't really have up and working yet, but uh, in the future should be able to sequence many humans in a day. So it'll be getting up to the speed of those Illumina machines we've already seen. So the obvious question would be, why is it so small? You've just seen what size sequences should be. Um, how can this one be so small? Well, those other machines all work on imaging. So what they've got in common with each other is in some way or another, they register light that's being emitted from the fluorescently labelled nucleotides. This machine does not work like that. So right away, we don't need cameras, we don't need lasers or sources of light, and we also don't need the mechanical parts to bring the camera in, move the camera out, bring the chemicals in, move the chemicals out. What's going on here is the minion is measuring electrical signals from the DNA that's already there. So again, we're not doing any of this replicating of DNA to build these clusters up that we do in Illumina. We take the DNA out of the cell and we just work with it right away. So what's going on here is we have um, a membrane and um, 
In this, we sit a protein nanopore or tube, so this pierces through the membrane. So the membrane will block the DNA from moving without it going through the nanopore. We have this nanopore here, and then on top of that, a motor protein, which, again, a bit like a polymerase, is ratcheting along the DNA. And this causes the DNA, when it passes through the nanopore, to move at a controlled speed. That means that we can register what's going on with it. So these nanopores exist in nature. You can come across them all the time in bacteria, and the DNA will pass through them at hundreds of thousands of bases per second. With this, we move it through at 450 bases per second. That gives the electrical sensors a chance to actually register what's going on. As each base moves through this nanopore, the different bases block the hole to a greater or lesser extent. And that creates a characteristic disturbance in the electrical current that's being applied across this membrane and produces this different kind of squiggle. So an A would read something high like this, but a different base would read down here, and the third base like this, and so on and so forth. So as we detect from the electrical sensor the different um, current that's coming through, we can then, through computer software, translate that into the DNA sequence. So we have this really small uh, hole here where the actual detection is, uh, is taking place. And you can probably see there's just a, a tiny section here where the base actually blocks it as it goes through. So because it's so small, uh, a lot of people have come up with all kinds of different ways that you could take this and what you could do with it. And one thing that I really love when talking to students is to ask them where they would take it. We get the best answers, uh, um, just things that, as scientists, we wouldn't even be bold enough to think of. Um, but some people have come up with some great ideas. And this was one of the earliest proof of concept articles for taking a sequencer out into the field with you. So this group were particularly interested in conservation. And they took a sequencer out to sequence different species of tree frog. So they were finding that it wasn't possible to get the frogs back into the lab to take samples from them. It didn't do the frogs any good. And also it was difficult to then correspond the frog to the actual habitat they'd taken it from. So their plan was to take the sequencer to the frog, find out more about what species were present <coughs> in different habitats, and in that way understand how better to conserve those species. It's also been used in Antarctica. So one important thing in Antarctica, always take a penguin with you to oversee your sequencing work. <laughs> And what they were particularly interested in doing here is finding out, were there microbes living in the um, soil and the atmosphere of Antarctica? What life was actually there? Again, if you try and take a sample and then take it out of Antarctica, it will warm up. So anything that's adapted to living in the cold will be at a disadvantage. But taking the sequencer and working right there, you can have the benefit of working with the sample when it's fresh, and you can correspond it to the actual environment that it's in. How about space? So um, because this doesn't have any moving parts and because it's working on electricity, which doesn't need gravity, you can use it in um, the International Space Station. And this is what Kate's doing here. So um, this was a proof of concept sequencing run. And there's a kind of twofold plan behind this. One would be, could it be used by the astronauts themselves to monitor their own health? So for example, if they're feeling unwell, could they take a sample, sequence it, and then following the advice of doctors back on Earth, choose the correct antibiotic to treat themselves with from a store that they have? The more ambitious idea would be, if they come to a planet, would it be possible for them to take samples from the planet and sequence it to see if there's any life there? Here is an example where it was actually used um, in a real medical outbreak to try and provoke an actual difference. So this was the Ebola outbreak. Um, a group from the University of Birmingham took DNA sequences to the Ebola outbreak, took samples from real patients, and sequenced them to try and understand how transmission was taking place. This was done in collaboration with some of the healthcare workers at the scene. What they were able to find out was that there were regions that were um, in contact with uh, other people that they had not necessarily considered could be a route of transmission. So what we'd see, for example, here is the different regions are um, coloured, and what they would see is instead of imagining that, for example, everybody in the red mixed with everybody in the red, everybody in the orange mixed with everybody in the orange, and their um, Ebola would be more like each other because it would be more closely related, actually the people who are in the red Ebola is spread out all across this kind of family tree they've built. So they can see that actually there's more mixing going on than might have otherwise been thought. 
using this kind of very detailed genomic information, which is more precise than any other medical tests, can be used to help understand how disease is spreading and then possibly translated into actually stopping an outbreak. So if we can do this, if we can go into space, surely we can go into a classroom, right? So this is something I'm really interested in uh, thinking a little bit more about. Um, it would be, I think, most suited to Key Stage 5 and sp supporting specific biology topics, including um, DNA sequencing, structure of DNA, structure of cells. But it also has the ability to revise and consolidate additional Key Stage 5 biology themes. So, for example, one thing we like to think about is um, taxonomy. So we're working here with a um, diverse sample that's got fungi, bacteria, and then different subclasses within bacteria. And it also has the ability to integrate with uh, chemistry and computing. So we had a practical that we tried out with the help of some students from the Perth School in Cambridge. And uh, the first thing we did was a very basic kind of um, high school style DNA extraction. So this was simply to add salt and soap to a mystery fruit smoothie and mix them together. So uh, here is one of the students having a go. Uh, this was recorded here by Kirsten, who was part of the Naked Scientist team, and the podcast is still available. So if you want to go and look up uh, November 2016, you'd find that podcast around if you'd like to have a listen to it. We then incubated it. Um, so uh, in the lab, traditionally, we'd use a water bath or a thermal block. Here we used a sink full of hot water. It worked pretty well. And then we precipitate that out using ethanol. So we just take some cold ethanol, pour it down the side of the tube, and the DNA um, sort of um, spins out almost like cotton wool. And we can then, um, using something like a toothpick, twirl the DNA around kind of like candy floss and lift it out. And we then keep it in a little tube like this. So step two, um, as you've seen, we have these whole labs that are dedicated to preparing DNA in exactly the way that we need it for for the sequencing that we do here on site. But there's a very um, rough and ready kind of way of preparing it that we can do in the field and we can also do um, in a school situation. So having exchanged the DNA into a water solution, we add a transposon which inserts into the DNA and breaks it so that we can um, ligate adapters and then sequence it. So we do a one minute incubation at 30 degrees then a one minute heat kill step to get rid of those transposons so they're not hanging around, keep on causing trouble. That's one minute at 80 degrees. And then a five minute room temperature adapter ligation. So in the lab, we would use something like this. This is a heat block to get up to 80 degrees. But in the classroom, what we do is for 30 degrees, we do a quick survey, which student has the hottest hands. Everybody normally knows which one it is. And um, get them to hold it like this for a minute. And then we can just put it into a beaker of hot water that's in, heated to 80 degrees. Um, we spin this down, so this is a micro centrifuge we use just to make sure everything is coming to the bottom of those tubes each time. These are um, something that we'd have in the lab regularly, but we can get these ultra small versions. That's about it. So then we pipette the DNA into the sequencer in Fresco. So um, this is just a close up. So we have a little tiny hole just under here, and we're simply going to just squirt the DNA into the top of the flow cell. It looks a bit like this. So um, this is something you'll be able to come up and see a bit later on. Um, if you have something like a projector or um, a smart board, um, we can be projecting the sequencing in real time um, up like this for the students to be watching as it's actually happening. And uh, this is quite a nice live view, so it would actually be um, twinkling and blinking. Every time it's green, it's good. So when it's green, we have a strand of DNA processing through the pore in this location. And uh, some of the other colours, are like blue, for example, would be when, when the pore has disappeared, so it's no longer active for sequencing. The flow cells sort of die off over time over the period of the run. And one thing I always like to point out to the students is um, we um, got in touch with Dr Nanapur and asked them to give us a particularly robust version of the software so we didn't have any bugs when we were out with the school. And uh, they very kindly gave us the exact version that they used to go on the space station. So when we take this out into the schools, we're using the exact same thing that the astronauts were using. I, I still find that really cool. Okay. So uh, it generally gets quite a lot of engagement from the students. Um, we like to get it as hands-on as possible and um, is pretty useful for um, getting um, people who have a diverse range of um, interests involved in what it might be like to be a real-life scientist for the day. 
So we've got some quite um, involved chemistry going on. There's a lot of data analysis we can do, and if you've got anybody that's particularly interested in coding, maybe writing Python scripts, we can um, work that into how we analyze the data. And then for the biology itself, the DNA extractions, again, we can work with pipettes, the centrifuge, all things that, as a scientist, I would use on a daily basis. It really is, as a practical, a great taste of what it's like to be in a lab for a day. And uh, so with that, I think I've probably talked long enough. I have no idea how I'm doing for time. So just to acknowledge um, Fran, everybody in the public engagement team, everybody at the schools that we've been into so far, the Naked Scientist guys and Oxford Nanopore, um, who've all put a lot into that project. Um, I have some contact information. You can get in touch. If you would be interested in a visit to your school, we would be interested to know a little bit more about what would make it work for you. So how much time could you dedicate to it? How many students would you have? How much notice would you need? So would you need to know a year in advance or you know two months in advance? Any information you can give that's going to help us to develop these lessons into a better stage in the next stage is something we'll be really happy to take on board. And uh, yeah, we have the uh, podcast here and there's a video online on YouTube as well of some school sequencing. So thanks very much for your attention. I'll be really happy to take a couple of questions. This, the, the little piece of kit you've just been talking about, mm. why do you use anything else? Isn't that the best? Yeah, um, so this makes us, you know how we talked about how the aluminum machines make a large amount of small pieces and the other mm. machine makes a small amount of large pieces. Yes. This makes a relatively small amount of data. So if you wanted to sequence a human to the same quality that we do on Illumina, it would take weeks and weeks and weeks compared to that one day. Um, that's why we have those kind of the mummy bear and the daddy bear machines, the bigger ones. They're all about that company trying to see if they can scale up to work at human size. At the moment, for example, with the um, Ebola outbreak, Ebola being a virus, it's quite easy to work with. But these larger species, well, we still need to work with those larger machines that have the higher throughput. Yeah, so was the frog quite time consuming on that. The what, sorry? The, the frog genome that they were, or did the frogs? Yeah, so with that's the quite a lot. Of, of that's material. right. With the frog, I think they, they had certain regions of the genome that they could look at that were distinctive. So they were looking at um, amplicons or specific regions that are diverse between the frogs. Yeah. When the, um, in the minion, mm -hmm. Uh, when the current was passed through the DNA to produce the disturbance which told you which uh, base it was, is the DNA itself producing any electricity? No, it, it wouldn't be. So right. the, the current's being passed across the membrane. The DNA is blocking the pore to a greater or lesser extent. The thing that's going on at the same time is we have an ionic solution that's also passing through the pore. So it's the passage of the ions that's getting blocked by the DNA. And then from that, that's the reason that the current is inter interrupted. I, I'm not going to sound silly, but you said there were several persons that actually donated their genome mm -hmm. to be sequences, uh, sequenced. Um, I remember I was doing my PhD when it started. Uh, someone say, asking me if I knew the gender of the mm -hmm. person. And uh, so we had all discussion about being male. Were they all males or were there some females in it? Because I always assumed it was only one, so I kind of... Yeah, I, as far as I'm aware, there were male and female donors. I don't know what happened with the final sequence itself, but I would guess if you had a female donor and there were two X chromosomes, it would be akin to having a third donor with a third X chromosome. It would have all become part of the, the mosaic that was sequenced. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't really know anyone that. As far as I know, there were, there were diverse donors, and probably predominantly male and Caucasian. Though. With the minion sequencing, yeah. um, are you just se you're sequencing a single strand there? That's so right. No yep. need for amplification. Yep. The, um, the um, ligation that you do, or is that just to get the se small sequence that you want? Is that right? So what we do with the ligation is we, we're ligating a predictable specific um, fragment of DNA on the end, and when we ligate that one, we also bring in that motor protein, so the, um, the protein that's controlling the speed that goes through. So it's the two of that together that helps us kick off the sequencing reaction. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do now is hand over to Gavin Kelsey, who's going to talk about the epigenetics program at the Babram Institute and how sequencing is involved in that. I think this has been an absolutely fantastic tour so far, um, really to see the scale of the operation here at the Sanger. Um, 
I come from a slightly different environment. Uh, we do sequencing at Babraham as well, um, but we have three machines. And the, the applications are obviously um, at a much different level of throughput, and many of the things that we're doing are a little bit more bespoke than trying to sequence 100,000 genomes. And very often we're interested in trying to get as much information as we can from a single cell rather than from, from a myriad different, different genomes. So um, I'm just going to give you a, a, a flavor of some of the, the work that uh, we're doing in the epigenetics program. I'll talk a little bit about what epigenetics is. Um, please do interrupt if you've got any questions at any time, if there's something that you would like some clarification on. Um, and uh, I'll just try to show you how, how important sequencing has become in the sort of basic science that we are doing, that, uh, that we're using to understand understand development and, and, and disease. So just to um, make sure we're all on the same, same wavelength here, epigenetics, many of you have probably come across this term. It's now become very current in the literature. It's, it's this uh, amazing extra level of information that exists on top of our, of our genome. Just to remind you that each cell in each nucleus, in each cell in our body, and we have many trillion cells, each nucleus has two meters worth of DNA in it. And so in order to uh, allow us to walk around, uh, that, that DNA has to be incredibly packaged into this sort of few nanometers worth of, of area in, inside a single, single, single nucleus. And so with that comes the problem that you are then um, highly condensing your genome information. And so in order for the cell to be able to access bits of the genome that it needs in that, that particular cell, it has to uh, encode on the DNA sequence other modifications that allow the, the genome to be segregated into those bits that are useful in that cell, the regions that have to be active and the regions that the, the cell doesn't, doesn't care, care about. So epigenetics is a layer of information that allows the genome to be contextualized in any particular cell. And we now know that uh, epigenetic states partition the genome into different active and inactive regions. And it does this in a number of ways. There are certain direct chemical mod modifications on the DNA strand itself, and the, and the most famous of this is DNA methylation. And then it also does it in the way that the DNA strand is uh, packaged across the proteins, the nucleosome proteins, that are then um, uh, further wrapped up in, into, into the chromosome structures. And there are a whole host of different chemical modifications that are applied to those proteins in the chroma chromatin that then also partition the DNA between active and inactive regions. And we each have a single genome, but we've got hundreds of different cell types, and each cell type will, will have its own epigenome because in each cell type you'll, uh, you'll be interested in having different, cell, uh, different genes active or, or inactive. So we might have one genome, but we'll have hundreds of different ep epigenomes. And there's an awful lot of information that we can now get by looking at epigenome sequence that uh, allows us to interpret where genes are and where they're active and where the regulatory sequences are of genes. And so here, for example, is, is uh, a map of the DNA methylation state in, in uh, this will be in mouse ES cells. And most of the genome is highly modified, has a lot of DNA methylation in it. But there are very distinctive regions where there's a lot, there much less DNA methylation. And this happens to be the active elements that allow genes to be active. DNA methylation is thought of a, as a repressive mark. It blocks proteins from interacting with the DNA. But where you need the DNA sequence to be active, the start site of a gene, the regulatory sequence of a gene, then the methylation is, is not there. So it, it, just in the, in, in, in the way that we could possibly uh, recreate a genome from, from archive material or archaeological material, you could actually potentially take the DNA from a fossil and see where the genes were active in that, in the, in that genome by looking at the methylation state, because methylation is a very stable chemical mark. Um, uh, 
uh, and on the level of, of the, chrom the chromatin, the proteins that wrap around the, the, the DNA, they also have very distinctive patterns of modifications associated with active regions of the genome. This is an active mark that is uh, present at the start site of genes, or this, here's a mark that, that we know to be repressive mark. So there's a tremendous um, lexicography of different modifications, epigenetic modifications that help us um, look at uh, where genes are active and, and where they are not. So, as I said, each cell will have its own epigenome. Each cell type will have its own epigenome. So the epigenetic information is much more plastic than, than the genome information. Obviously, the, the, our genomes are being hit by UV light, sunlight, other um, environmental agents that could potentially be damage, d damaging the, the d DNA, but broadly speaking, our genome sequence is pretty constant. Whereas the epigenetic information has to be modified to, throughout, throughout the life course, and uh, we understand also that it can also be a responsive to environmental um, conditions, to what we eat, um, uh, to what we drink, etc. So there's a, a, a degree to which our epigenomes um, are a reflection of our life course events as well. And some of these things can be uh, uh, pathological. So epigenetic uh, information is also very important as providing a cellular memory. So during development, as different cell lineages arise, they will, as they will each acquire their own epigenetic state, their epigenome. And some of that will be irreversible, so the decisions will have been made early on in development, and then that is fixed. And a classic case is the X chromosome in, in, in female mammalian cells. So very early in female embryonic development, uh, the two X chromosomes will have been equally active, but a decision will be made in each cell as to which of those X chromosomes will then be silenced, and then that silent state will be maintained throughout the life course of, of, of the womb. So it's a, ver it's a very early epigenetic decision and then it is perpetuated throughout the life course. And we know that there are some epigenetic signals that can pass from one generation to, to the next. And this, this, this memory component is also a potential problem um, because if epigenetic errors arise, throughout, possibly because of the environment or smoking toxins or whatever else, that some of those can be perpetuated as well. And we know that clearly there are a huge number of, of mutations, DNA sequence mutations, that contribute to cancer. But cancer is also, importantly, also an epigenetic disease where some genes that are ordinarily there to prevent cells from proliferating uncontrolled are silenced through epigenetic uh, errors rather than DNA, uh, DNA sequence errors. So it's very important that we consider an epigenetic uh, component. So, so the reason why epigenetic information can be such a useful memory um, is, is exemplified through uh, DNA methylation. That was the first epigenetic um, state that we were aware of and we've, been known, we've known about it for about 30 or 40 years. And so in the, in the mammalian genome, the um, methylation occurs on cytosines and mostly where a cytosine is next to a guanine. And because of uh, Watson and Crick base pairing, uh, on the other strand, you will have a cytosine here and a guanine here. And you will have what's called symmetrical methylation. So the top strand and the bottom strand will be equally methylated. And this is very important because it allows at DNA replication the, uh, the, the new DNA strand to, to acquire the methylation state of the, of the parental strand because the, there's, a, there's an enzyme, DNA methyltransferase 1, which sits at the replication fork when DNA is being, being, being copied and will put back a methylation on the, on the new strand um, opposite to where it was on the old strand. So the default is to maintain a DNA methylation pattern. Of course, there are mechanisms in the cell that, by which methylation can, can, be, can be modulated. But there are also situations during development where this, this rule is, this default situation is, is over, overwritten. And, that's, uh, and here, for example, this is uh, data from the mouse where we're looking at the, the overall methylation level of the genome. 
And you can see the tremendous transitions uh, um, during the specification of the germ cells, during the development of the, of the sperm or, or, or the egg. And then again, after fertilization, there's a, there's a tremendous rewriting of, of, the, of the DNA methylation sequence. Um, and then as, as the, the embryo develops and lineages are, are formed and specified, the methylation is, is, is put back. So the, the dramatic changes in, in the methylation program, the epigenetic program, this is probably associated with the need of a, of a cell to completely change its identity from being an, an ordinary somatic cell to being a germ cell, or then again from being a gamete to being, being an embryonic cell. So associated with these major train changes in cell state, uh, there will be changes in, in this epigenetic mark. And, and we can see how rapid this can be. This is uh, immunofluorescence uh, studies done on uh, mouse eggs at the time of fertilization. And uh, th this is uh, staining with an antibody for the, for, the, for the methylated site. Here, just after fertilization, you can see the female pronucleus and, the, and then the sperm-derived pronucleus. And within a few hours, the, we've completely lost the, the methylation on, on the sperm-derived uh, pronucleus. So tremendous uh, changes in, 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 the, in the epigenetic state. And one of the important consequences of this is it, it provides barriers to transmitting epigenetic information from one generation to the next. So we're trying to ensure that the sins that we do to ourselves aren't transmitted to our offspring because the, the genome is pretty good at eradicating uh, that memory at this critical, critical time. If we had epigenetic errors in the sperm or, or the egg, we would hope that they would be eliminated um, as the, uh, as the, as the uh, gametes fuse and create a, uh, create a new embryo. Fortunately, it's not as simple as that because we do know that there are cases that depend absolutely on transmitting epigenetic information from, from parent and offspring. And that's in the case of a set of genes called, called imprinted genes. We have about 200 of these genes in our genome, and these have the unique property in that one copy is permanently silenced. And these are very important genes for regulating our growth. Um, and the function of our, of, of our placenta. And these genes uh, have this monoallelic silencing because they were differently marked by DNA methylation in the sperm and the egg, and that methylation difference has been maintained throughout um, uh, subsequent um, development. So this, these are exceptions. They break the rule. Um, and we know that these are very important. This is uh, an infant that is uh, um, presenting with a condition called transnatal uh, diabetes. It's one of the most severe forms of um, uh, intrauterine um, uh, growth restriction. Uh, um, it's a very rare, rare disorder, uh, fortunately. And the reason is that uh, there's a defect in a single imprinted gene. So this gene ordinarily is only expressed from uh, from the copy inherited from the father, the copy inherited from the mother is permanently silenced. But in this individual, for one reason or another, both copies are now expressed. So it's the absence of that proper epigenetic, epigenetic mark that is causing this, this um, uh, severe intrauterine growth restriction. So, um, so imprinting exemplifies that there can be transmission of epigenetic information from, from parent uh, to offspring. We know that it applies to about 200 of our genes. Is this more widespread? Is it the tip of an iceberg? Um, does it indicate that, that there are circumstances where epigenetic information can be corrupted? And so that therefore, we're very interested in being able to measure, measure this type of epi epigenetic information in the genome. So this is where sequencing comes in, and this is where there has been a revolution in epigenetic studies in the same way as there's been a revolution in genomic studies. Um, ten years ago, we couldn't, couldn't do this, and it really has been because of the enabling um, the fact that we can now sequence epigenomes at the sort of, the sort of price that we can sequence a genome. It's, it's something that we, it's now become, become routine. So the, uh, the methodology we, we're using here, we're using a chemical reaction to, um, uh, to 
um, uh, process the DNA. Uh, sodium bisulfite is, uh, is a reagent that allows you to um, modify cytosine bases, but only if they are not protected by DNA methylation. So this uh, reagent will deaminate cytosines and convert them to uracils, and then after uh, uh, amplification and sequencing, those uracils will become th uh, thymidines, whereas the methylated cytosines are protected from that deamination reaction. So we're now converting an epigenetic change to a sequence change, and of course now we can read these wonderfully on those, on those Illumina uh, machines. And so we can, we, can, we can read at very high resolution um, methylation information across, across a genome. Um, here, for example, I'm blowing up onto this is actually the promoter region, the start site of that gene that's involved in transient neonatal diabetes. These are the CPG sites in, in the genome that, that uh, we can get from DNA sequence. And this is the methylation uh, tagging of each of those, of those sites. So we can now look at single base resolution and, and very accurately, because this, this is a very, a very well-controlled biochemical reaction, we can, we can say uh, if, if this site is 100% methylated or 10% methylated or 11% methylated or whatever. Really, it's a very, it's a, it's a very powerful methodology. And we, can, and we can take this, and rather than um, sequence buckets of DNA, populations of cells, we can somewhat adapt the, the methodology to al allow us to get information from single cells. And so here are um, single cell bisulfite sequencing profiles from, from single mouse, um, uh, mouse eggs. Um, unfortunately, this is a, a biochemistry that is very good also at degrading the DNA, so we do lose some inf information. But by and large, from a single cell, we can get a profile of DNA methylation that looks very similar to, to that that we could obtain from 100 cells or 1,000 cells or a million cells. And so that's been very important for us in looking at um, um, really being able to follow methylation, epigenetic information, in those tissues that are very hard to, to, to come by. So um, now we can use this sort of technology to really understand what happens to DNA methylation uh, in that critical period in the early embryo, um, where the methylation goes here. For example, this is all done in, in mouse at this stage. This is where the methylation was in the egg. Three and a half days after fertilization, when we have an early blastocyst, most of that DNA methylation has been removed from the genome. Um, still, there's a very low level of methylation. Four and a half days once the blastocyst is starting to, to become more, more um, uh, sophisticated. And then a day later, this is now looking at the epiblast, which is a part of the embryo that will form the embryo proper. And then wallop, you can see that a set within a very short period of time, methylation is being put back comprehensively across the whole of the genome. Uh, there's some indication that it's happening less rapidly in bits of the embryo that will form the placental li lineages, the extra embryo uh, line lineages, and we're very interested in, 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 in that difference. So we're now interested in, in, in uh, using this technology to see whether we can find epigenetic errors that might be induced by factors such as the diet that we're consuming, uh, whether epigenetic information in, in germ cells and gametes it deteriorates with, with age. And of course, we know that uh, age is, is one of the, uh, the best predictors of uh, growing uh, infertility. Uh, and whether the procedures associated with assisted reproduction could have an epigenetic cost by inducing errors in, in the epigenome. And if so, are these in bits of the genome that doesn't really matter because they'll be over, overwritten, or, or the, are they in bits of the genome that could have, have implications? So I'm just going to show you a, a little bit of data that we're, we're generating at, at the moment. Um, and this is now moving from, from uh, mouse studies uh, where we have no limitations on material, but now looking, looking in, in human embryos and, and, and human eggs. So here, for example, uh, this is in collaboration with, with a, an IVF group in, uh, in, in Brussels, uh, where they were interested in, in um, 
uh, assessing if there was any epigenetic problem with some of the technology that, that they were using. And this uh, is a, a bit of the human genome. This is a, the, the methylation analysis that we've done using single human blastocysts. And these are now sorted by the grade of the blastocyst. An AA grade uh, blastocyst uh, refers to high quality inner cell mass, high quality trophectoderm, and a BB grade blastocyst will be a, a blastocyst which is not as good. Uh, um, these will have a, a, a lower rate of successful uh, pregnancy when, they, when they're transferred. And, and we could see from this, uh, from this analysis is that the, the, the lower grade blastocysts are not as good as removing the DNA methylation that was provided by the egg and the sperm. But rather more interesting, we find that there are particular parts of the genome where the, the, there are um, uh, even greater differences in methylation between the high-grade and the low-grade blastocyst. And this is a, a region of methylation that covers, covers a, a single gene. And so that suggests to us that there might actually be a pre-existing methylation difference in the eggs from which these blastocysts were, were, were created. And so we can use the single cell uh, sequencing that we have now to interrogate single human oocytes to see whether there are differences in the methylation landscape of those oocytes that could be related to problems in um, a blastocyst progression um, uh, subsequently. And so this is uh, single cell uh, sequencing of 35 individual germinal vesicle stage uh, uh, human oocytes and by and large you see that the pattern of methylation is, is quite well conserved. The pink are regions where there's no methylation. The green is regions where there's a high level of methylation. This is the sort of characteristic methylation landscape that we, we know about in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the oocyte, in the mouse with human oocyte. And we, we start to look at uh, regions that have abnormal variation in their methylation patterns. And, um, and indeed, we find that indeed that same gene that I showed you had this abnormally low level of methylation in the, in the blastocyst has a variable state of methylation in the oocyte. So it could be that there's a genetic reason for this, meaning that some, um, some donors will have a methylation difference across the whole of this gene. And this is an area that we're very interested in, in, in following on. So this is where we're, we're, we're heading with our um, epigenome sequencing and our single cell sequencing, allowing us to get into reproductive biology in a way that we couldn't have dreamed of just a few years ago. Thank you. Are there triggers within um, the aging process that will change the methylation and then impact fertility that you've been able to identify? We don't know that yet. Um, uh, the studies we're doing at the moment are we're doing, doing in the mouse as a proof of concept to see whether we can identify differences in, in DNA methylation in, in mouse uh, eggs, um, and at this point in time, we're just assembling those, those, those data sets. We know from, certainly from other tissues, that epigenetic information uh, does change with age, and um, there's, um, uh, it's been possible to create what's called a, a methylation clock. So if you take any, any cell from, any, from, from, from one of you, any one of you, and get and do a methylation sequencing on it, um, you can then uh, estimate your age with an accuracy of plus or minus three, three or four years. So the methylation information is changing as we age. Some of it is, is we're getting gains and losses depending on which particular uh, a, a bit of the ge genome uh, it is. And some of that might be uh, pathological and some of it might be completely in in incidental. Following that one up, actually, so some people with infertility problems, could it be to do with methylation state of their eggs? Would they have eggs that are prematurely aged or something? You know, you That's a possibility. That's certainly something that uh, we would like to, to, to look at. We, we know from, from mouse studies that if you completely eliminate all DNA methylation from, from, from the egg, it doesn't really matter. But it could be that, that, that the methylation is a very good marker for where genes are active. Yeah. And so uh, we might think of using it to, 
to um, identify abnormal gene activity uh, in, uh, in, in the egg. And some of that could be associated with problems in, in, in uh, fertility or you know, problems with ovarian reserve. There yeah. could be genes that, that uh, um, are really promoting cell death, atresia, and uh, it would be interesting to try to find those and if you this. Do, so when you demethylate the eggs, do they, they then cre recreate the methylation pattern later, not later on fine again, do they? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Sorry to hog it, but I have, I have got the, the question I wanted to ask was these, these babies with this um, insulin problem. Mm -hmm. So you've spotted what the problem is. Of course, you start thinking therapy. What, you know, is, there, is there anything with that knowledge that can be done now? Because presumably the wonderful idea would be to remethylate Mm -hmm. the gene that's active and silence it, but I, is that possible? It's not possible at the moment. No. Um, clearly, epigenetic drugs are, are used increasingly in, in certain cancers, um, but the problem is that none of them can target a specific gene. They can be used to globally change yeah. a certain histone modification or globally alter DNA methylation, then you're just using them in, as a way to target you know, um, proliferating cells or things like that. Yeah. Um, not, not clearly, so there, is, there is a lot of interest in um, not just genome editing using CRISPR technologies, but epigenome editing. And we certainly know we can do that in cells, and we can probably do that in, in, in mice, where we can take the CRISPR machinery and tag on to it a, um, a DNA methyl transferase, for example. Mm -hmm. And so we can then um, recruit a DNA methylation to a certain, certain gene with pretty good precision and then induce DNA methylation on that gene. Now, it could be that, we, that, that you really need to have the CRISPR system there all the time because um, you can't induce um, irreversible changes in the epigenome. And these are the experiments will, will, will need, need to be worked out in, in cell models. There might well be some, some disorders, some cancers where yeah, an epigenome therapy um, um, might be very interesting, but surely it's a long time away before we're anywhere close to that. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, I just want to check if my, my understanding is right. So um, I understand that the, um, the each gene has two alleles or two copies, and methylation silence is one of them, and that's why we get one of the copies expressed. But um, then, um, so each cell in our body has a whole genome, and um, let's say a skin cell is skin cell, and skin cell is because skin cell, um, because the all other genes in that cell is are silenced by methylation, and only the genes that are related to um, to make that cell skin cell um, is expressed. Is that that that, that that's what is 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 it, is it correct? That my understanding. Uh, um, yes, more more or less, or up up to a point. Um, certainly, each cell will cell type will have a very distinctive DNA methylation landscape. And the start sites of active genes will, will have no DNA methylation. Methylation is used as, as a very general repressive mark. It's very important for making sure that transposable elements and repetitive elements aren't active and can't jump around in our genome. It's one of the major reasons why, how we keep jumping genes at, 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 uh, at, at, uh, at bay. Um, so it's a, it's a very important general rep repressive mark. But actually, in order for a for the start site of a gene to be active, it has to have no DNA methylation there. So you will, so you yes, you'll be able to um, take a methylome and then predict what cell it was, and and that's also used in in cancers for identifying from a metastasis what would be the primary tumor, because each cell type will have its distinctive DNA methylation pattern, and therefore if you have metastases, you can then look at the methylation state of that and predict where the primary tumor was because the, the cell type methylome is so distinctive. So one more question. 
is that um, <coughs> so um, gene is a sort of um, it's 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 a, it's a map for um, or instruction um, for um, a, a cell um, what cell it becomes and um, uh, we have this uh, a particular pattern for epigenetics. Um, this pattern should have an instruction so that, um, for example, a skin cell, the, the pattern that we have in a skin cell um, is different from the pattern that we have in a cell in, a, in our eye. Where is that instruction come from? That's a, that's a very good question. And um, uh, I think th there are a variety of mechanisms. One of, one of the key mechanisms will be the cell type specific transcription factors, the proteins that recognize specific sequences for the genes that have to be active in that cell type or, or, or not. Um, so up to a point, um, cell identity is determined by the transcriptional network, the gene activity network in that, in that cell, which will be, will be determined by those master regulators. Mm -hmm. um, but together with that, epigenetic information is very often used once those master regulators have made their, turned on the switch, if you like, and then those master regulators later in development are no longer active, no longer around. So it's the epigenetics that takes over and consolidates or reinforces that state and makes sure that you can't go back from a skin cell to, be, to becoming a, 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 another cell type. It's another one about understanding uh, the process, which I haven't got quite straight. That's the erasure fertilization. Now, if I've understood you correctly, which I may not have done, the, the sperm is erased epigenomically, uh, and the, the female factor, the egg factor, is not. So the egg factor goes forward, does it, without erasure. So that means that we're our cell content that is not epige epigenetically marked is all female. It's, it's not as, as simple as, as that. Um, indeed, right at fertilization, a lot of the epigenetic information is taken, taken off the sperm-derived chromosomes. And indeed, in the sperm, the, the DNA is wrapped in a completely different way. It's not organized into regular chromosomes. It's, it's highly condensed and wrapped around proteins called proteomines. So you have to do a tremendous amount of epigenetic engineering to the sperm chromosomes when they ar arrive in the egg. And so they have to create a normal epigenome from scratch, where, whereas the egg is bringing with it a much more conventional organization of DNA methylation and chromat chromatin uh, organization. And that is modified not as radically, but it also has to be has to be modified. So by the time you get to uh, beyond uh, six or seven cell divisions, where you've got a couple of hundred cells, then broadly speaking, the that epigenetic legacy from the sperm and the oocyte has been equalized. Apart from these rare genes, such as imprinted genes, that have have for reasons that we don't fully understand yet hung on to the epigenetic state that they got, got from the egg. They've been, they've been protected from, from, from the erasure. Okay, so when, well, more questions keep arising, so I'll stick to just one more. Um, how does the, um, the sperm DNA, ex-sperm DNA, get reconstituted correctly because it's been erased? How, how does it, how does that happen? Uh, I, I get a very good question. So, um, there are going to be multiple levels of interaction between how the chromatin is being put on and how the DNA methylation is being put on. It's going to be driven partly by DNA sequence and partly by availability, accessibility of, of, of the genome. I don't think we really fully understand how you create the methylation 
landscape or the epigenetic landscape. These are areas where we're only really starting to, to, to be able to, to look at it now that we have the methodologies that allow us to look in you know, small numbers of cells where we can really track things in, in, in the early embryo. And using genetic models in the mouse where we can remove some of the, remove some of the factors and then to see what, what, what the effect is of taking out one of the, one of the chromatin or the epigenetic mod modifiers. So the male side of us, if we are male, will uh, not be the same as our fathers, epigenetically, whereas uh, the mother is but, going to be pretty much. Um, again, the, the mother, yes, the maternal side will up, up to a point, and certainly the, Im the imprinted genes are much more likely to have been determined in the female germline than the, 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 the male germline, simply because of th there's a greater potential to carry forward epigenetic information from the maternal side than, than the paternal side. Yeah. <laughs> Any more? Yes, actually, something I remember reading a long time ago about the idea that during the development of an embryo, right from the early eggs, the point where differentiation into different cell types or the destiny of the cells um, is determined by the position in the embryo as they move around. And that sometimes, that I, I read reading about like a gradient of some kind of substance. And I'm just wondering if that, I don't know whether that's still believed or even understood better now, but whether that might have something to do with how different levels of methylation get triggered. Um, certainly morphogen gradients are, are real part and parcel of developmental biology and developmental processes. Um, and quite likely they will have, have an impact also on, on epigenetic information. And um, I think um, if we go back to some of the classical models like Drosophila, where morphogen gradients are tremendously important in setting up cell identity, um, then it's known that some of the factors that, that, that lock in cell identity will be the, the major epigenetic modifiers that we now understand they're also working in, 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 in mammalian systems. So, so many of the epigenetic factors were discovered first in, in things like, like the fruit flies through, you know, through wonderful genetic experiments. And, and more or less, most of those factors are the same factors that we use in, in, uh, in human development. So what we're going to do now is do a quick showcase of some resources and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for you just to sort of chat about what you like and if there's anything um, that you feel needs to be out there as well. So um, I've based a lot of this on a website called yourgenome.org, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, it's one that's developed by the public engagement team. Um, here at campus, but I have also put in a few um, that are not from us as well. Um, so your genome, I'm a bit biased, is quite a useful resource. Um, it's, like I said, this is the, the URL here, www.yourgenome.org. It's got a range of content on it that can be used by yourselves, but also for your students as well. So some of the, the content is in what we call fact pages and some is in story pages. Um, so I'm just going to pull out a few of the sequencing fact pages. So if you literally just put in DNA sequencing in a search ball and then sort of just um, filter it by just the fact pages, you'll get something that looks like this. And a lot of these pages are very relevant to what you now have to teach at school at A level. So I've just pulled out a few. On your tables also, I've just printed out a couple as well, just so you can sort of see the language that's used in the page there in that see-through um, pocket. But we've got, for example, what is capillary sequencing? So if you have to talk about Sanger sequencing, this is a really good way that explains what is Sanger sequencing, what are the processes there, what are the stages that you have to go through. We also have a page on what is a Lumina method? So that's the next gen sequencing that we sort of talked about earlier. So we've got, again, a step by step of what has to happen. We've also got 454 sequencing. So I think pyro sequencing has, has crept in as well. I see Kim smiling. Um, so pyro sequencing was sort of the second stage on from capillary sequencing. So we don't have capillary sequences here anymore or 454 machines here anymore. We are purely Illumina. But if you want to find out about those technologies, we have all of these and these are all 
now covered by, I know at least OCR cover this particularly, um, so definitely recommend it. Even if it's just to increase your knowledge base, it can be really helpful or use it for you know, um, revision for your students. Um, if you want story pages, these are a little bit more like articles, a little bit more reading, but again, they can give a bit more of a flavour, the stories behind here. So again, these are literally just the stories by typing in DNA sequencing in the search bar, and you can have um, a few of the ones, for example, a little bit more detail on next generation sequencing, but then also we have third generation sequencing, so this is bringing in the pack bio technology as well. So this will hopefully give you that little extra layer of information that you'll need to help you talk about sequencing more confidently in the classroom. We also have an animation. So again, going back to the Sanger sequencing, um, it's four minutes long, so I won't, won't play it now. But um, again, it's here. It covers all the major principles of Sanger sequencing, how you add the dideoxy bases, how you have to, the different temperatures involved in raising it, lowering it, raising it again, and so on. This is, this is what this shot is here. It sort of shows you what temperature it has to go up to to get all those mechanisms happening. So it's really lovely. It's in 3D. It's four minutes and 54, so it's not too long. So you should, your, your students shouldn't drift off, hopefully. Um, but even if you just set it as a homework, um, it's quite good for them. We also have this one, which is 2D at the moment. It's currently flash-based, um, but again, this literally takes you step by step through the process of the, the next generation, the Illumina sequencing, from how you break up the DNA fragment with sound waves, how you add the adapters, how you have the PCR on the slide, and so on. So it really takes you step by step through the whole process as well. So again, good to support your teaching in the classroom as well. Now, for a bit of fun, you can do this. Um, please note, it can get addictive. Um, this is called you versus machine. You have to see if you can sequence as fast as a machine. Um, so you have to make sure you put the, r the right color at the right times, whether it's this A, or C, or T, or G. So highly recommend it. It's a bit of fun, but it really hits home the whole capillary sequencing. Um, as you need to do, so I highly recommend it. It will you will eat up your lunch breaks doing this because you do want to just beat your score. Um, okay, if you like, you'll get your your um, students talking more about the applications and the ethical implications of DNA sequencing and the fact it's getting cheaper and more accessible. We have a discussion based activity called genome generation. So it um, comes in a card form. So you can download all these off the um, the website. You have a scenario card, which gives you a scenario. I've focused in on the should a baby has its genome sequence from birth, because it's quite a nice topical one. You have this. You can spend about five, ten minutes talking about the scenario. You then have what we call information cards. So these give you little nuggets of information that can help maybe change your position on that topic. You then can spend like another 10 minutes or so doing this. You then throw in what we call the issue cards. And these will throw in sort of tricky questions that you might not have thought of. So should that data be made available to the police and insurance companies, for example? And it just gets you thinking about the other societal ethics of it as well. So this is quite a nice activity if you want to sort of then look at the ethics, the societal impacts. Um, we have other scenarios on should a young 15 um, year old ask her dad to um, take a test to see if she's at risk of the BRCA1 variant for breast cancer. We've got one that looks at heart disease and should an uh, insurance company know about this, the guy's heart disease condition. We've got one about um, a young mum finding out whether she has schizophrenia or not um, and variants associated with that. So we've got one with twins. One twin gets sequenced and finds out they're at risk of Alzheimer's. Does she tell her twin or her other twin or not? So lots of quite juicy little scenarios to get your teeth into. And of course, it's not just about your genome. Um, we've talked about 100,000 um, genomes today. And they actually have a lovely website which has um, some resources on it. And if you want to find out more about how they are sequencing genomes, how they're applying it, how they're using it. They've got videos, infographics, and animations, which are quite really quite informative and sort of talk about that side of things as well. They've even got case studies of how um, it's been used to diagnose a child with rare disease and, and how that's had an impact on the family as well. So there's some quite nice stories that you can tell in the classroom. So they're just some of the highlights that I've, I've sort of picked out. Um, also on your tables, we have an activity that 
we use as well called DNA to Data. So if you want a copy of this, please let me know and I can email it to you. But again, it's, it's based on Sanger sequencing, but it, it gets them to put statements to how the human genome was sequenced in the right order. So again, if you have to talk about the human genome sequence um, sequencing project, this is all the stages that were involved in sequencing. And it does also time with a 2D animation that we have on there as well. So again, couple of several animations um, or resources to sort of help you sort of explore the topic. So on your tables, we've got an iPad. So if you want to look at some of the online resources, you can do. But we've got a good sort of 15, well, sort of 10 minutes. So if you want to have a chat, sort of say what you like, what you don't like, we'll do a quick feedback session in about 10 minutes and you can let us know.